In our last lesson, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, we looked at the four agents of God's salvation. And in part one, we looked at the first two agents, which were the prophets who prophesied and the Spirit of Christ who guided them. Uh, that salvation, today we're going to look at the final two, uh, but we know in between there, the salvation was made manifest. There is a glorious uh, Greek text, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 14. It says, uh, where is my... <clears throat> it says, Kaihologos sarx egenito, kaihologos, and the word... Sarx, flesh, uh, egenito, became the word, uh, God's word became flesh. And here's this neat phrase, uh, eskenosen en gemin. Eskenosen means to tent. Uh, it's normally translated, um, and he dwelt among us. But eskenosen means he tented among us. He came and he pitched his tent with us, living in ours. Uh, he tabernacled with us. Uh, in a sense, uh, he violated the uh, COVID um, uh, quarantine, and it says that he came and he camped out with us. So John announced him as having been here. Uh, salvation in Christ our Messiah. When we look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, uh, Luke 4 and 16 Jesus himself said, I am here. Uh, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus had just read Isaiah chapter 61 to them, which was a, a looking forward to the day when the Messiah would arrive. And Jesus sat down and said, today this scripture has been fulfilled amongst you. There are other times uh, in the gospels where Jesus says the same thing. I'm here, I'm him. All we have to do is recall uh, Jesus on his way, traveling, stopped over in Samaria and met the woman at the well. The woman at the well, <clears throat> um, John chapter four, verse 25, John four twenty-five. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. What an amazing phrase. Uh, and to kind of wrap it up, Jesus, after he has finished his passion, completed his passion, he now gives charge to his disciples and he tells them to go out and to tell everybody this message, the things that they've witnessed. So Mark 16 and 15, and he said to them, go out into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And in that verse, we see the third agent uh, of God's salvation is announced. Salvation has come. Jesus did what he needed to do, was resurrected to prove he was who he was. And then he initiates the third agent of salvation, the third part of God's plan and that was people going out and proclaiming the truth to the world. Those who would proclaim the gospel, the evangelists. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, 
And concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in these things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. We are going to look at the final two agents of God's salvation, which is going to be the evangelists, those who are commanded to go out and proclaim the message, and finally an interesting look at angels. Even angels were fascinated by the message of God's grace, and the scripture says they longed to look into these things. So let's start with the apostles who preached it, the evangelists who preached the message, uh, going back and beginning in verse 12 there. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news. The gospel message goes forth. Uh, the gospel preaching is announced by the apostles. Uh, the third stage of God's eschatology. Eschatology is a timeline. We're now at the third stage of the timeline that God had decided to use to usher in salvation for mankind. <clears throat> and this third phase of the timeline is uh, the announcement, the proclaiming of the gospel, the proclaiming that salvation had come, it had been witnessed, and now it was time to go out and tell the world about it. And so Jesus anticipating this, uh, if we remember John chapter 17, the whole chapter is Jesus' farewell prayer just before he undergoes his passion. And in the third part of that pericope, Jesus prays for a certain group of people that are going to believe in him. Let me read it to you, John 17 and verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Through their word. Announcing now that Jesus was going to use his apostles to go out and to pre preach and proclaim the message. And Jesus prays for people that are going to believe in him through the message that gets preached. Paul uh, had an argument about preaching. Uh, Paul had to sort of explain the mystery as to why the Jews were not responding to the gospel. Uh, the, the Jews, God's chosen people, and that's what Romans chapter 10 is all about. Why aren't the Jews responding? And so Paul lays out God's eschatology, God's plan, and he said, the stage that we're at now is the announcement and proclaiming of the gospel. And that is the problem for the Jews at this point. We're going to pick up Romans 10 and verse 14. He announces the plan of God. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? All right. How are they to believe in whom they've never heard? How are they to hear unless someone preaches? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And then he quotes an Old Testament passage. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. He just laid out for them the step-by-step -step plan, kind of in reverse order. And it started out, he says, with the preaching of the message. That way, everybody gets a chance to hear it when people hear it, they will most likely uh, believe it. And if they believe it, uh, they will then call on the one that they believe in for their salvation. And then he concludes that section by saying, uh, all of this has been done. And the problem in their particular situation is the Jews stumbled over the stumbling stone. They did not like the message that was being preached but just the same, that was how God's plan was to reach out to mankind. He says, clearly God hasn't failed. Clearly this is because people are stubborn and rebellious and just don't want to hear that particular message. <clears throat> 
If we move on, uh, John, the apostle that Jesus loved, does a phenomenal uh, example at helping us to understand this whole pro uh, process, uh, this whole third phase of uh, salvation being initiated. And he spells it out for us in uh, his epistle, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. John explains it like this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. We've seen it with our own eyes. We've looked upon it and touched it with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifested and we've seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we are proclaiming to you so that you too can have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that <clears throat> our joy may be complete. John broke it down for them that John and the other apostles were the eyewitnesses. Jesus was very real. <clears throat> he came and dwelt with us. He tabernacled. He camped out with us, he says. And we're the ones who saw him. We're the ones who touched him. Uh, there's another word for seeing. Uh, theaomai versus blepo, to see. The second word for seeing is like some theatrical. John says it's like it was like a theatrical event. We were amazed by what our eyes saw. And there's uh, two different words he used for touching Jesus. Um, the second word was uh, to grab something and investigate it to see what it's all about. John says, we did that. We saw him, heard him, we touched him, we investigated what he was all about. We were absolutely amazed by him. And we are proclaiming those things to the world so that the world can experience this same salvation. So in the going out and preaching about Jesus, uh, you know, often today, a person wonders, well, since we aren't the apostles, we aren't the eyewitnesses, where, do, where does one get the credentials to be able to go out and talk about Jesus? Where does somebody get uh, approved or get the stamp of approval to be able to go out and do this? Uh, does a person need to be ordained? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've seen uh, in the mission field, uh, in certain faiths, when you're evangelizing, one of the things that they want to use against the person teaching is, who do you think you are? Who are you to tell us what to do? Or uh, in the cases that I've seen uh, in evangelism, uh, Catholics in Peru, uh, I've heard them tell my mother, uh, how can you possibly know more than the priests? How should we trust you? Uh, other denominations claim to have apostles and prophets. And so the call is, why should we trust you when we have prophets that can tell us the truth? And so <clears throat> there is this appeal to authority sometimes. And, uh, you know, we've seen it, I think, in our day during this coronavirus thing. Uh, there are people that have their own eyewitness account. There are people that are saying, look, this is what I did. And it helped me out quite a bit. And yet certain people in the news are not liking those stories. And they're suggesting uh, you can't possibly know more than the experts. Who do you think you are? Uh, we need to listen to the experts and everybody else needs to just pipe down. But these people are saying from their personal experience, look, I tried it and it worked for me. And so that's the way people tend to be. You know, I've noticed, unfortunately, uh, also even in the church, when you go to a, a workshop, uh, it, it kind of saddens me, even though there are several of these people that I love to go listen to. Uh, I'll have to admit, when I look at a, a roster of speakers at a workshop, uh, it's dismaying to see that every one of them has the word PhD behind their name. And you look at that list and you think, wow, Aren't there any preachers or evangelists that have something to say? 
that don't have credentials, that don't have their doctorate? Is that really what qualifies a person to talk about the gospel? Well, Paul, uh, just in case we need to know, Paul makes it clear for us. 1 Corinthians, um, oh boy, I didn't give you the chapter. First Corinthians one uh, and verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God for it is written. I want you to remember that phrase. It is written. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21, For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek out wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Verse 24, But those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is is stronger than men. <clears throat> Paul says, all I have to worry about preaching is the gospel. Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected for the sins of mankind. And as Jesus said, go forth, preach the gospel, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You know, there is a pretty simple, encouraging formula in that and notice that Paul started out his argument, it is written, simply quoting scriptures. And he says that God is pleased through the foolishness of what is preached, the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, that is so amazing and fascinating and beautiful to me. So then what's the nature of good preaching? Well, if we look at Paul's example, it's to start out your argument by saying it is written. I want to take you to a couple verses where Jesus uses the same uh, technique. Uh, it falls back on the words of God Himself. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, he said, uh, when Satan commanded, uh, Satan asked him to command these stones to become bread. But he answered, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan tries again. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. And then again, Jesus says, Matthew 4, 7. Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And finally, uh, Satan takes Jesus to the high point of the temple, uh, tells him to look down, says, everything you can see, I'll give you. And he says, uh, if you'll fall down and worship me, Matthew 4 and verse 10, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall serve and worship the Lord your God on him only shall you serve. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that a school teacher was concerned about the youth uh, of the world that more and more of them are growing up agnostic, not believing and she said, what do you think we should do for the, the teens? How do we get young people back in the church? And you know, the only thing that my heart could go back to was uh, scripture. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep are going to hear my voice. My sheep, my sheep are going to recognize uh, the message and they're going to come to me. It reminds me of um, Ezekiel. Uh, right around chapter 36 or 37, 37, uh, the valley of dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel, God takes him out and looks at a valley of dry bones when Ezekiel says, there's no hope. There's no hope because your people have gone wicked and they've rejected you. God says, let me show you something. Here's what you do with people that have rejected me. And uh, you think that there's no hope. 
took him out to a valley of dry bones, said, do you see these dry bones? He says, prophesy to them my words. And as soon as Ezekiel did that, the bones all sort of clankling, they came back together, the sinews, the muscles, and the skin all came back on and they became a, a undefeatable, powerful army is what the text says. And what I walk away from that is saying, when something looks hopeless, when something looks bleak, what do you do? You say, it is written. You speak God's word into death and it can come to life and form a mighty, mighty army. That's the faith that we have in God's words. If you can start your argument with the words, it is written, then you are qualified to go out and to teach God's word about salvation. Uh, you know, sometimes when you look at, if you'll watch debates, uh, a Christian debating an atheist, uh, sometimes um, the story can get mocked. Uh, a God who is willing to become human, first of all, is unheard of in most religions. Most people uh, can't fathom that, uh, wouldn't like it, wouldn't tolerate that. And yet worse than that, he became a human. And then he, on top of that, became a servant. He didn't come to lead uh, by dominating people. He came being a servant. There's a weakness, it seems like, in that message. Uh, a savior that was humiliated, a savior that was spit on, uh, a savior that was mocked. And yet God says, I am pleased. I am pleased for that to be the message. Of course, his death, burial, and resurrection, he says, but that simple message, whatever that may look like to the world, God says, I'm happy to let that be the means of salvation for people. Uh, so Paul says, uh, uh, I'm not going to let people's opinion of this get me down. Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. Uh, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Paul said, I'm excited, I'm eager, and nothing will deter me. <clears throat> so, what was the message? What was it that got spoken? And I want to take you in the scripture to Acts chapter 2, which is the first time this message gets proclaimed. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Here's what the message of the gospel sounds like. Peter gets up and talks. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Verse 37. And now when they heard this, they were cut to their hearts and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now, hold on just for a second there. It's an interesting response to the gospel. What shall we do? And it's because in the first century, the first century understanding of sin, uh, and I, I'm not recalling the Greek word right off the bat, but it means to be dyed, to have gotten dye on you and now you're stained. Normally this Greek word gets translated uh, unclean, defiled, um, in fact, the same word was used when the, uh, the Sanhedrin didn't go into the, uh, dug on, what is uh, Herod's palace where Pilate was uh, judging Jesus? What is that called? I, I think it was the praetorium. I'm pretty sure that's the word I'm looking for. Anyway, and it says the Jews did not want to go into his courtyard because they didn't want to defile themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover lamb. So this idea of being defiled meant you were stained, you were stuck with something, and you were stuck with it until you underwent 
um, a purging, a sacrifice, a particular animal, uh, something you particular you had to do. That was the understanding of the first century uh, people, is that you were stuck with sin until you purged it somehow. So them realizing that they are stuck with the sin of having killed their Messiah, they said, what do we do? And so Peter tells them how to get that sin off of themselves. Verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now there is the gospel message. There is the third uh, uh, agent of God's salvation is announcing, proclaiming that very message. Uh, get your pencil and paper because I'm going to give you 11 times in the book of Acts where this exact same uh, message gets preached and we see the conversion of people. So here they are, 11 of them. Uh, the Jews on Pentecost, which I just read you, Acts chapter 2. The Samaritans, Acts chapter 8. Simon the Sorcerer, Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8. Saul is converted, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 22. And Acts chapter 26. Paul's story gets retold by Luke, the author of the book of Acts. Paul's story gets retold three times in the book of Luke. That goes a long way into showing how important Luke thought the message of conversion was. Cornelius' story is told in Acts chapter 10. Lydia's story, Acts chapter 16. The jailer, Acts chapter 16. Some Athenians, Acts chapter 17. The Corinthians, Acts chapter 18. And the Ephesians, Acts chapter 19. You know, as we talk about this third agent of salvation, the going forth and preaching of the gospel, I really hope you'll take a good look at that gospel message, uh, those 11 examples of the gospel message being preached. And in 10 of the 11 of those, the way the people respond to the message is always the same. Repent, and they were baptized. Uh, there is a gospel that is going forward today in our day, and it's not the same gospel as the one that we see uh, outlined for us. Today, they just uh, want to suggest that people just accept Jesus, that people just have a personal relationship with Jesus, that people just say out loud, I need you, Jesus, or that people just pray some kind of a prayer. My suggestion is that you look at those examples, and then you go through and read the 11 examples of the gospel going forward, and you're going to find that there is nowhere in Scripture where their version of the gospel is ever mentioned. Uh, and so we can be clear on what that gospel message was, just going back to the book of Acts, starting with those conversion stories. And then lastly, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, this work of going forward and announcing the gospel was important enough in God's eyes that he says it should be a full-time job for some people. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, In the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel, they should get their living by the gospel. You know, uh, I always thought that it would be a person's job when I had other uh, full-time secular work. Uh, I always was evangelizing, going out and, and preaching, uh, and I felt like it was just a duty to go on and do that no matter what. But since I've been in the ministry uh, full time, uh, it has been a blessing because you really need full time. In fact, if I had to be honest, um, I don't think I stop. I mean, yes, there is a day where I'll go hiking, but there's not a day where you where I wake up thinking I need to get something down. I need to go talk to someone about something. You know, uh, there is an old rule of thumb that a sermon is going to take one hour of preparation for every one minute of the sermon. So what that means is if you're preaching a 15 or 20 minute sermon, you're going to need 15 or 20 hours of preparation. 
Someone told me that a long time ago and I have found it to be very, very true. In most cases, it takes me even longer than that. But just think of this, if you're going to preach a 45-minute sermon, if you're going to preach a one-hour sermon, you've got 45 hours of preparation just for one sermon. Now, there is the opinion out there that says, well, yeah, but once you get all your sermons written and in your little files, then you've got it made because you get to just re-preach sermons you already have saved up. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of insight into that. There are 66 books in the Bible, and my goal, Lord willing, would be to preach through each one of those books in the Bible. Uh, The Scripture says all uh, of God's Word is profitable to us, so we need to look at all of it. Well, if it takes on average about a year to preach through a book of the Bible, that's what I've found so far, Uh, If it takes on average a year to preach through a book of the Bible, and there are 66 books that I need to work my way through, that means that I get to start reusing my sermons uh, when I'm 115. There you go. Number four, the fourth agent of salvation, uh, the angels. The angels have been longing to look into God's plans. The angels have been longing to see what were the prophets writing about? What is God's plan going to look like? So let's go to back to verse 12. Uh, it was revealed to them they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Angels in heavenly places have been eagerly desiring to see this plan unfold. Jesus uh, reiterated that, Matthew 13 and 16, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, did not see it, to hear what you hear, and they did not hear it. Jesus was speaking to the first century disciples that in the first century, during that time of the Roman Empire, this mystery was finally revealed uh, and something that the prophets, righteous people, and angels were waiting for, were longing to see. Angels are fascinated by God's grace Uh, There is a word long to look into, paracupto. This word translated long to look into, paracupto means to physically bend down and search. Uh, The word is used when John, it says in the gospel, when John got to the tomb of Jesus, he bent down and looked in. Uh, Angels are stooping down, uh, investigating about these things. I don't know uh, if angels uh, had a concept of of grace because uh, as far as I remember, angels are in one of two positions. Rebellious angels have been put away uh, waiting for the day of judgment and we know that they are going to be unchained and throw into the lake of sulfur, uh, eternal damnation for them. In fact, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But then there's the other angels that apparently stayed good with God, uh, uh, worshipped God, exalted God. And so there's only two groups of angels. And I wonder if they were amazed at this concept of grace that God's other creation, that us, uh, would get to look into. So angels take a big part um, in all of this. We'll read Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1 and verse 14 are not the angels ministering spirits that are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Angels minister to those who are going to receive uh, this message of salvation. Matthew 4 and verse 11, angels came to minister to Jesus. Uh, The devil left him and behold, angels came and they were ministering to him. 
If we go all the way back to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel being very prophetic, uh, looking very far into the future, and Daniel's prayers are finally answered when an angel appears to him, says, Daniel, your prayers have been heard. And he says, hey, I would have got here quicker, Daniel, but I was having to fight off the king of uh, Persia, or the, the prince of Persia. And he says, uh, man, Michael finally came. Uh, I'm going to read that to you because I hope I'm getting those names right. Michael had to come help. And that's what took me so long to get to you, Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Now, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision concerning those days. This angel came to announce to Daniel something that was going to happen in the future, something that that very angel couldn't wait to see for himself. We'll remember from Luke chapter 1, an angel appeared to Mary to announce to her uh, the birth of the Messiah. Uh, oh, and I didn't write this one down, but just off the, off the cuff, uh, I'm pretty sure an angel appeared to, uh, oh boy, Zacchaeus, no, Zacchaeus, Zechariah, oh, <laughs> uh, pretty sure it was Zechariah, uh, um, uh, John's to-be dad, remember he was uh, performing his duties in the temple and he was struck, uh, couldn't speak uh, until John was born because he didn't believe, so angels have been involved in the whole process, and then here is something amazing to me, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, <clears throat> Paul says that to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what was the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God, God's patience, God's mercy, God's grace. Uh, and what was the text? What we looked at uh, the simplicity of the message. These angels, uh, have gotten to learn more about their creator through watching his mystery work itself out in real time. Uh, there's a great quote in F.F. F. Bruce's commentary on Ephesians, but it has to do with um, the message of the cross. And he says, uh, the wisdom of God revealed in the cross of Christ and in its saving efficacy in the lives of believers upsets all conventional notions of wisdom and it demands their reappraisal in the minds of the spiritually mature. Mature. Isn't that the truth? The more we read scripture, the more we contemplate Jesus, the more we uh, learn about God's plan that, um, oh, wasn't it in Philippians, uh, Christ being in the very form and nature of God did not think equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself of all of that power, all of that grandiosity. He emptied himself of his glory and he became a servant. You know, you can't read that texts like that in the age of Rambos, in the age of muscle men, in the age of, uh, of, uh, uh, the study of history were the most dictatorial, evil, blatantly uh, harsh men have risen to rule over countries. And God's message is, no, my, my message of beauty is humility, patience, self-sacrifice, grace, 
mercy to the point that the living God emptied himself of his divineness, became like us, and even more so made himself a servant to come serve us. You can't help but know the message of the gospel and have to rethink your perspective about what is truly awesome and amazing in this world, in this life. So different than what the community around us would suggest. The angels finally rejoice when someone is converted. Rejoice when they see the simplicity of God's message. Take seed in a person's heart, right? Uh, You must be born again, born of imperishable seed. Once that seed gets planted and takes root in someone's heart, it blossoms and it yields, what was the, a hundredfold, uh, tenfold, I don't know, a hundredfold, what it must be like to see a person take root and unfold in their faith in God, their Christianity, and the new awareness that they have. This, uh, is the word existential? Mm-mm. Something beyond this life, awareness. And so Luke chapter 15 and verse 7, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So how does the story end? We've seen all four agents of God's salvation pan out in verses 10 through 12 of Peter's song of praise. And I want to finish it up with one more scripture. Uh, It goes back to the opening, how we started. We started out with the prophecies and we said it began way back in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. And now we see the big picture, the finality of it all. Romans chapter 5 and verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That is salvation. That is the message. And that's going to conclude our study. Uh, The prophets prophesied about it. The Holy Spirit revealed it to them. The apostles went out and announced it and proclaimed it, and the angels were a part of making it happen, and now they sit back and rejoice every time they see it take root in a person's life. This completes Peter's song of praise, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. Hope you guys have been blessed by that. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy in our life. Thank you for your love in our life, and thank you for your plan, unrolling it through the prophets, uh, the guarantee that it is correct because the, the uh, Holy Spirit was guiding them through it, uh, for the, uh, the price that was paid to get that message announced, and letting us know that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one person that repents, that the heavens are happy to see a person come to your salvation. Thank you for that message. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.